Hello and welcome to Manibil. This is part 11 of my deconstruction of Keith Frankish's lecture series on illusionism. And we are in lecture 2, still the case against Qualia, some one hour and six minutes and something into it. And I would like to sort of get ahead and let me see if I can <laughs> sort of cherry pick the best arguments uh, for and against what he's talking about. Though I would say that at this point, I'm, I have a very, very strong sense that he is basically cherry picking what, whatever sort of, okay, this argument over there from this book by, you know, for instance, Dennett uh, 30 years ago, I can use that to sort of make you think that it's sort of a, it's sort of, when, when if, if you're cherry picking arguments to cl cl make some claims about some fundamental stuff in metaphysics, you're not doing good philosophy, in my opinion, right? This is not how you do metaphysics, right? And if he's not doing metaphysics, what is he doing, right? Because qualia potentially can be the most important aspect of your ex sort of experience. It is the experience uh, in, in a large, to a large extent, if not all of the experience as such, right? Might depend on your definition. But it's like, um, and when it's sort of, okay, we, we take some quote from a book there, and there's an, a, a neuroscience, whatever, you know, a, a scientific experiment over there that points in the direction, and, and then metaphors about uh, beetles in a box, and, you know, running uh, actors, you know, whatever. It, it seems like it's, it's basically sort of cherry-picking whatever you want to, in order to connect the dots in the direction you want to go rather than encompassing everything and maybe doing some Cartesian doubt to get all the bad apples out of the basket and then say, what is left? That is my reduction base, and I will build everything from that, right? And maybe there's also a need to state when you're doing metaphysics, why am I actually doing metaphysics, right? Why am I doing it? And, you know, that why might be important in order for other people who are, you know, consuming your philosophy to figure out whether or not you're just, you know, confirmation bias or, or there's actually some objective, maybe that's a stupid, but, but there's some reasoned or rational foundation for why you're going in that direction. Why do we need to do metaphysics? Why do we need to have an idea of knowledge? Why do we need to have an, a story about ethics and so on, right? So is that the purpose of philosophy? Is it to establish metaphysics and then establish knowledge and then establish ethics or something like that? Is that why you are and we are doing philosophy, right? And and this kind of these uh, academic philosophers who sort of you know cornered themselves into a very small and then they are arguing within that confined space of of philosophy and sort of rejecting or ignoring the rest is a sign of you know, cor corrupt philosophy. It has to be everything. Otherwise, it's like having a car factory, you know, Ford Motor Company, creating only basically wheels. And I say, but, but I'm going, yeah, they're fancy, they're gloriously perfect, uh, you know, whatever, uh, beautiful wheels. But I need the rest of the car in order to live my life, right? Or do what I want in my life. So, to, to be, I mean, and if you are educated as philosopher, why would you, wouldn't you want to do everything, right? What is your urge to do this stuff, this, you know, minute little thing, potentially a big, big thing maybe when we're doing qualia, but what seems to be a subset of philosophy and not nothing else? Why would you want to do that if you're interested in philosophy? So what is your interest, right? Is it just to be able to sit there and sound like you're very fancy, smart, and so on, in order to, you know, further your existence, right? Which is basically having a university pay for your life, for your life, right? So these kinds of, uh, you know, just be aware that self-interest is a very big thing. And that's why people sort of, uh, you know, play it down. Say, no, 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 I'm into saving the world. And yeah, 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 right, right. If you're not doing all of philosophy, 
I will basically say you're not really interested in philosophy. You're just, you're having some other agenda that this subset discussion of philosophy just works towards, right? I'll have to draw that conclusion no matter what you say and no matter what somebody else say, unless I can find some very, very good argument, right, that would convince me otherwise. Okay, so let's head into it. One hour, six minutes, and 48 seconds. Here's how Dennett puts it. In spite of first appearances, there really is only a verbal difference between these two theories. The two theories tell exactly the same story, except for where they place a mythical great divide, a point in time and hence a place in space, whose fine-grained location is nothing that subjects can help them locate, and whose location is also neutral with regard to all other features of their theories. This is a difference that makes no difference. It's, it's a, a, an imaginary great divide like the one that this girl is... Okay, I really don't like this lingo, right? Let, let's have it again. So in spite of first appearances, there is really, only, really, what is that? Only a verbal difference between two theories, the two theories. The two theories tell exactly the same story, except for where they place a mythical great divide. A mythical, what is that? A great divide, right? What is that? A point in time and hence a place in space? whose fine-grained location is nothing that subjects fine-grained location. What the hell is that? Subjects can help them locate. Subjects can help them. What subject? Is some subject helping some other subject locating something, which is a great divide in a theory of stories or whose location is also neutral with regard to all other features of their theories. I'm, I'm lost now, right? I'm lost. This is a difference that makes no difference. I mean, fuck you, man, right? This is sophist speak, in my opinion, right? This is someone who likes to hear himself talk, uh, Mr. Dennett, and, you know, 30 years ago. And is going to great lengths in order to shove a lot of fancy words into there, in, in order to maybe cover up there isn't really any good philosophy there. It just sounds like it's eloquent and, and you know, you know, high licks number, something like that, right? It's, it's smart and, 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 you know, this is a difference that makes no difference, right? So it's sort of equivocating the two words difference and sort of trying to maybe even gaslight you into thinking or distrusting your your ability to, to do coherent philosophy by throwing all these, I mean, first appearances. What is an appearance when we're talking qualia, right? A verbal difference between two theories. But theories are not something you're doing in metaphysics, right? A theory is about what happens in the world in, in science. The, and you need uh, have to have established metaphysics and epistemology in order to do theories, in my opinion, right? The two theories tell exactly the same story, but stories are not experiences. Stories are interpretations of experience. You don't experience. A story is something about what is going on, right? Or what happened or something like that. It's story. You can't tell a story about elephant. You can tell a story about what an elephant did or might do or did back in time or myth or something like that. That is an event, something going on. But going ons are interpretations because there is no qualia to, to a, a, an event, right? What color does an event have? What sound does an event have? Does it have such a thing? Does it have a taste? Does it have a feel? Does it have a smell? No, it doesn't. Because in interpretation from the inside of your experience, the I or the you or the watcher or the Cartesian theorizer has made this interpretation, right? So a story has nothing to do with the qualia, other than the qualia must be there in order for you to create the story. But that you created a story based on the qualia has no bearing on the qualia. There's no going the other way, right? 
you have some qualia, you have some objectifications. These objects move around, you create a story about what's going on. And, you know, you can maybe even tell other people using language about that story. But you can't take a story and then say, that is going to explain the qualia. Because you needed to have qualia in order to get to the any way of creating a story. Otherwise, you wouldn't create a story if there weren't qualia. So qualia is... is uh, first level, right? And second or third level or fourth level might be an interpretation. But then you can use that fourth level interpretation in order to cr elaborate or, or fabulate about the, 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 um, the importance of whatever about first level stuff, right? It doesn't work. You're violating a structured manner of understanding of what is going on in, in this mind of ours or yours or mine, right? In my opinion. And all these fancy words like great divide, ooh, right? A place in space and fine-grained location. Then a subject. What, what, what is meant by a subject? There's a lot of these terms that you might have a prior understanding of what they entail. But that, that doesn't matter because you don't know if that's the same way that Keith Frankish understands them. Or Dennett, for that matter. Because he doesn't define what he means by them, right? And also, there's a problem with definitions that just giving a definition is um, problematic. Or, I mean, it's a good idea, but then there are new terms used, right? Then you have to define those new terms. And then you can keep going. Well, how far can you keep going in this getting down in this sort of uh, Cartesian exercise? Well, to what I would call the reduction base. At that point, you can't define it anymore, right? That's where you start your metaphysics, in my opinion. At least it's a it's a good start, right? You might find out that's not you haven't got to the right place, and you might, but at least, right? Because the words we use are is uh, some kind of re reflection of what is going on in our minds. It wasn't language that came first; it all it was the minds that came first, and then we use language in order to communicate whatever, right? We might even lie because we are so smart that we can actually pretend to have experience that we don't have, right? So I have now I have no respect for this garbage, right? So far at least. I there's nothing in at, at this point where I say he's onto something that makes sense to me, right? At this point it's sort of cherry picking Connecting the dots in a, a you know confirmation bias fashion, right? So is is running across here in this um, this piece of pavement art. Now you might say, well, that's 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 all very well, and uh, yes, it, it all seems to make sense. But still, how did it seem to the subject at the actual moment of the experience, at the moment when the woman ran past? Did it seem that she was wearing glasses or, or, or not? At the moment when the dots were flashed, did it seem that there were two separate dots or a single moving dot? How did it seem to the subject at that very moment? Of course, we 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 can agree about their that their reactions later and their reports later were the same. That they reported seeing a moving dot and so on. That they reported seeing a woman with glasses and they remembered that. But at that very moment, at that instant of the experience, how did it seem? Well, then it says that's that's a bad question. Postulating a, a real seeming, in addition to the judging or taking expressed in the subject's report, in their reports and other reactions, is multiplying entities beyond necessity. Worse, it's multiplying entities beyond possibility. When you discard Cartesian dualism, you really must discard the show that would have gone on in the Cartesian theatre. So here you get rid of Cartesian dualism, get rid of the, the soul as the spectator, and then you've got to get rid of the show that the spectator would have been watching. Uh, 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 th th this is sort of... I, I'm... You, you get rid of the show? What, what? Postulating a real seeming in addition to the judging or taking expressed in the subject's report is multiplying entities beyond necessity. Worse, it is multiplying entities beyond possibility. When you discard Cartesian dualism, you really must discard the show that would have gone on in the Cartesian theatre. 
I don't know why. I don't. I don't seem that there's a good argument in there. Real seeming. What is that? Right. Addition to the judging or taking expressed in the subject's report. I'm not interested in people reporting. I'm interested in my own experiences because reporting is a kind of experience. This sounds or maybe text or you know what something uh, smoke signals, right? But it's still qualia. I need to have qualia in order to get to somebody's report, right? <laughs> oh my God. Why can't this guy see he's basically contradicting? He's using qualia in order to refute qualia. Isn't it stupid, man? I mean, am I missing something here? So, but, but why do we need to discard the dualism? We are, isn't he sort of that that Descartes maybe run run into some problems uh, settling on dualism? Doesn't invalidate the theater, does it? Why are you need? I mean, why do you need to get rid of the theater? Maybe there's only the theater, and what is beyond is there's nothing there, or maybe there's something there, but you can't get to it. So all you have is your theater, and that's what you're using in an abstracting and making theories from and having ideas what is beyond that theater, and that's the the approach to dualism. But you just can't get to the other thing, right? So, I mean, as I pointed out in earlier parts of this, that he's suffering from the materialist fallacy, that, as I call it, and there might be a better term to use for that, right? But that your experience is subpar or, 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 or subordinate to a larger external world, a more perfect external world, of which you also have access to. So he can tell you that it's not important what goes on in your mind, the qualia, right? But the point is, in order for you to have any idea what is going on at all, you need qualia, right? So if you don't need the qualia, why the hell do you have senses that gives you qualia? Or the senses is also it's kind of qualia. You had an interpretation of those qualia in that reality or that theater you're referring to. So you have to be careful what you're talking about, right? I mind you, right? But then saying, I have the outside world, so I don't need that inside world. That is fucking crazy, right? Because you only have an idea of any kind of outside world because you have an inside world, right? So how he squares this circle, I, I have no fucking idea. And I have never seen any materialist of any kind even addressing that there is a contradiction or a paradox built into this thinking. Right, as I tried to, uh, you know, uh, elaborate on with Stefan Molyneux not so long ago, in his so-called metaphysics debate, where I was the other part, so to say. Right, he didn't, he didn't even get there is a contradiction built into what he's thinking because he's afraid he's going to go crazy or something like that. Well, maybe you are going to go crazy, but that that that, that doesn't invalidate your philosophy just because you don't like it, right? And he should be the first person to to show that, or at least Stefan Molyneux, right? And this guy, he doesn't even realize it either. So it seems that the most complicated kinds of philosophy arrives from this misunderstanding, this mis, uh, this misunderstanding or the lack of humility in what you can actually say about your experience and how you interpret it, right? It becomes so much simpler and functional Instead of all these arrows or whatever goes on and there's an apple that is red there and there's a gray apple out there and all these apples, man. I mean, I don't, I only experience one apple at a time, right? On this, it's a different apple. I don't have a gray apple and a red apple, so to say, right? So what are you actually talking about? Because it's not an experience I can have. So it is an abstraction you're working from. Well, an abstraction is not your qualia. And if you're using that abstraction to refute qualia, you're violating the whole idea, because you wouldn't have the abstraction unless you had the qualia. And that's also what you do by saying, hey, there's a report over there. No, the report is an qualia. It's a sound, maybe, right? Or 
colors on a piece of paper that you interpret as language and whatever statements. So you are using that which you are trying to refute in order to refute it, right? That is a begging the question of the worst kind, in my opinion, because it's foundational to your metaphysics. Okay. What does Dennett put in place of the Cartesian theater? What model does he, of consciousness does he recommend instead? Um, well, he calls it the multiple drafts model. Uh, I'll sketch it very briefly here. Um, it's something like this. We know that sensory processing consists of many localized events in the brain. There are separate systems for, make, for discriminating different features. The, the, the initial onset of the stimulus, uh, locate, this is in case of, of vision, location, shape, color, motion, type of object, faces, and so on. These are discriminated by different systems in different locations in the brain at um, different times. Uh, these discriminations are made at, at different times and in different places. And they all have effects. As soon as they're made, they start having effects. They contribute to further discriminations and also to a host, in, directly and indirectly, to a host of reactions. Uh, as soon as a discrimination is made, it becomes available to be used by others. I also find it a weak position, just, you know, copy-pasting arguments for somebody else without being sort of taking it in and maybe revising your own philosophy and then presenting your own philosophy. Why do you have to lean up against somebody else? This guy said, right? Can't you handle your own? I mean, can you stand your own ground and say, well, this is my philosophy? It, it doesn't work very well if you have to use some kind of qualia, which is your interpretation, I would say, about some object called that you call Dennett that apparently presented some arguments to you that you would just accept that qualia as a kind of philosophy. Yes, you could say it's a kind of philosophy, but it's still qualia, and you need that qualia in order to get the philosophy. You then use here in order to refute that qualia as unimportant or, or you know, you're against that qualia. How does that work, man? systems in the brain. As Danny puts it, the natural but naive question is to ask is where does it all come together? This is the, the, the Cartesian uh, theatre uh, uh, assumption again. So where does it all come together? But it, the where question, you, you can't start to say where if you haven't, I mean, he is, uh, he is stretching his philosophy beyond what he can possibly do without having done some prior more fundamental philosophy within this metaphysics in order to enable him to talk about where where that there's there's no where in a color there's no where in a sound and there's no what else do you have what kind of where do you have and where the, how does that arrive you just talking about where doesn't give you a where right so is that sort of spatiality? Well, space, does that arrive through your senses or does, does your mind add uh, space, right? Well, I would say, of course, your mind adds space and then it just places these qualia to some, in some way or another within that space that it creates, right? Because you have in a sense where space arrives, right? How would that be? Where would it come through your senses? Where, how would it be there then? If it's outside, on the other side of your senses, right, that space, then space has to enter your mind somehow, right? How does it do that? I, I wouldn't say, I would say you, it doesn't. The mind creates space, right? Space is a purely a mental construct on which your qualia can be placed. So the where does, where does it come together? Well, the where is a part of your mind then, right? In my philosophy, so it goes on in your mind somehow. That's where it all goes on. Here's a, a... And if it didn't go on in your mind, you wouldn't have access to it, right? So it, you have to be very careful when you're dealing with this stuff. He's just throwing words at you from, you know, just keeping throwing words at you. And this guy said, and this guy said, a new word, this word, this word, right? 
uh, until you sort of potentially bow down and say, okay, I guess I can handle this big thing, right? A, a different um, version of our, of our diagram, in which a more accurate, a more realistic version of our diagram, instead of those two big, solid arrows of information and reaction. It's so, again, what is that? You, you are not experiencing that. Nobody experiences this, right? All you are saying, there is an experience of me experiencing somebody else who has a brain or whatever it is, right? But then you're only experiencing that apple potentially outside that person, right? So if you're, if you're saying there is an outside apple that you are experiencing as an inside apple, right? Then if that person says, I'm experiencing apple and you are experiencing the same thing, it's very likely that what you interpret as an outside must be an outside apple outside that person. So when you're experiencing the same apple, it's also outside your mind, right? That's a very good kind of philosophy, in my opinion. But you can't decipher that it's an outside without stating it's an outside or going from an axiom that says, I am treating this as an outside because all of this must be some kind of inside experience to you, right? In order for you to experience it. Because if it was outside, you couldn't experience it because it, then it's no part, not part of your mind. If you create this dichotomy between an inside and outside. So it's axiomatically stated, I am treating this particular kinds of experiences as something outside. And then the paradox arrives, right? Okay, if it's outside, how the hell can you experience it? No, you can't. You can't experience the outside, but you can say, you can axiomatically state, I am treating it as if it's an outside, but it's still an inside. So at merely, it can be a representation of that which is outside. And that you arrive at the Kantian explanation, well, then you can't get to the things themselves because you merely have experiences, experiences of them, right? So, okay. It's more like this. Lots of, of different, uh, uh, lots of separate uh, information on reactive processes uh, occurring uh, in parallel. Where does it all come together? Nowhere. This is Dennett again. The answer is nowhere. Some of these distributed contentful states soon die out, leaving no further traces. Others do leave traces on subsequent verbal reports of experience and memory, on semantic readiness and other varieties of perceptual set. That's your dispositions to respond to future stimuli, what kind of expectations you have about the next round of stimuli. The answer is nowhere. Nowhere. If it's going on, it can't be nowhere. I mean, it, even if you can't say where it is in relation to something else, that it is there, the experience. Wherever it is, there is an experience. You might not need to say where it is, because where is always some kind of relation to something else that is somewhere, right? So where entails you are using space, right? Space is necessary in order to talk about nowhere. So have you made a de definition on understanding, metaphysical understanding, what you mean by space? No. So, and, and what is nowhere, right? If it's nowhere, how do you argue for something you have just spent more than a couple of hours talking about and saying it's nowhere? What the hell does that mean? Others do leave traces on subsequent verbal reports of experience and memory on semantic readiness and other varieties of perceptual set on emotional state, behavioral proclivities and so forth. Oh man, so forth. It's like, oh, I don't have to mention all this. It's just so forth, right? If it's not important, why, why are you not? If they're important, why are you not stating them? And if they're not important, why do you need to say so forth, right? And s semantic readiness, what the hell is that, right? Varieties of perceptual set 
Semantics is the meaning of words, right? And other varieties of perception. Perception is that. He's mixing categories, right? This is nonsense, right? And if there is some coherence or, or any kind of argument in there, it's so convoluted and and what's it called? It's a word salad, as they are called it technically, right? That sort of hiding that he might not actually have any good philosophy there. It's not. It's not founded in anything basic or any kind of reduction base. It's just these intuition pumps. It's. I have a notion and I'm throwing words at it, and it's good, right, right, right. I don't buy it. I don't buy it. If it's not fucking crystal clear to me what the meaning is, I'm basically rejecting it, right? Lion, how you're disposed to describe them uh, on emotional state, behavioral proclivities, and so forth. Uh, but there's no point where it's all um, uh, all comes together. Okay, some of these effects, for instance, influences on subsequent verbal reports, are at least symptomatic of consciousness. And it means is that if someone reports having experienced something, having seen or heard it, then that's usually taken to be um, uh, good enough reason. What is it about these verbal reports, right? Verbal is another word for sound, right? So he's using, he's talking, at least he's mentioning something that is qualia based. And he's apparently using that to work out a case against qualia. I mean, call me uh, stupid, but that sounds like a circular argument to me, right? Or, or I, 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 an invalid argument. He's using a foundation he's trying to argue against in order to argue against it. That's stupid, man, right? There, and, and, and also, this is why it's not a good idea to have these fluffy word salads, because you might camouflage all sorts of problem in the philosophy in this elaborate terms used, right? Be very strict and clear about this is not poetry, right? This is not Tolstoy, whatever, right? Uh, this is philosophy. It needs to be fucking crystal clear what you're talking about. Very strict, very methodical, very bare bone and essential. And this is what I mean by this and so on, right? From a reduction base and all the way up, right? All these some of these effects, for instance, influence on subsequent verbal reports, all the symptoms of consciousness, but there is no one place in the brain though which all causal trains must pass in order to deposit the content in consciousness. Are those claims? Is this philosophy, philosophical insight? Is it just claiming stuff? Uh, what the hell, man, right? What is it based on? Is it based on some prior understanding of a reduction base of some kind? No, 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 we have none of that. It's just throwing words at you until you sort of give up, right? Isn't to describe them as having been uh, conscious of it, as having uh, uh, had a conscious experience of it. But there is no one place in the brain through which all these causal trains must pass in order to, to deposit their content in consciousness. So if you're if you're talking about consciousness as with that which you have access to in order to talk about anything, then what? Are, how are you talking about that causal train that are depositing some content in the consciousness? Because you have to be conscious now of it in order to talk about it. And those trains are then outside consciousness because they arrive with that content. So how do you know about those trains? right? But how do you get to it? You need to state that clearly how you get to talk about that which is outside your experience. Or your consciousness, right? So you're just making stuff up about what's going on beyond what you can experience. In order to say, well, then when it becomes an experience, it doesn't matter because I know what the train arrived with. How do you get to talk about that and use that to eliminate that which you have actually access to, which are the Ukrainian? Ah, oh, man. That's not how consciousness works. So on this view, there's no definitive version of experience presented in the Cartesian theater. Instead, there are, there are multiple... And, and I might mention, I'm a little agitated about these things, right? Because they are fundamentally important. If you get this wrong, right? 
it's potentially, you know, mass murder on a on a global scale, on on a biblical scale, right? If you get things wrong, it's very very wrong. I don't mean in a moral sense, but in a sort of technical sense, right? And I guess I have to find my I have to find my my power supply. Uh, so, but it's um, I better get go get it now on before I run out of juice. So hang on a second. I I won't stop the recording, but then I have to splice videos together. So bear with me, please. Right. Sorry about that. Back in the chain gang. <laughs> Multiple versions of experience that have been continually constructed, and elaborated, revised, and deleted. Then it compares experience to different drafts of an academic essay that are, that are all being circulated at the same time. So you, you, you prepare a draft of your essay and you pass it to friends and colleagues and ask them to comment on it. Meanwhile, maybe you, you keep working on a, on a further draft. Some of the original drafts come back from with comments from colleagues, which perhaps you incorporate into a third draft, and uh, then maybe you, you, uh, you circulate that and so on. Now, someone might say, well, but which of these drafts represents your real views? Well, uh, your views are changing all the time. They're evolving. They're adapting. There are different versions of them. Maybe you go back to an, to an earlier draft at some point. If someone wants to know your views, uh, the answer they... But a draft is not a qualia. Whatever you use your qualia for doesn't invalidate the qualia that you have all sorts of ideas of actions and abstractions and so on from these qualia, right? So it's like you're saying, okay, now I have the elephant. Now I don't need the qualia. They're just sort of whatever, right? So now I have elephant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you need the qualia in order to get to the elephant, right? You need a qualia in order to get to understand there's a draft or there's a reaction from somebody else. That's also a qualia, an email on your computer screen, which is colors, so on, right? So I, I don't understand this, uh, like... Um, there's something going on in the mind. Who cares? But we have because I have the draft, right? Um, uh, and CT scans and all that. Well, that's also some computer screen of some kind, right? Manipulated by a graphics card and so on. It's like it, it, you can't stand in the bucket and pull yourself up at the same time, right? This is what he's doing. He's using that which he's trying to explain away. It 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 will never work this thing, right? And and also it might point to a problem that he needs to spend God knows how many examples and words and 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 lectures uh, in this series. I think it's uh, six or seven, eight hours long, in order to argue that that which I used to experience this lecture is not useful, is is unnecessary, right? So it's like it's 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 a weird kind of philosophy, this, right? It's a pathetic attempt at saving materialism 
by rejecting that which you are constantly using in order to get around in that material, right? In those materials, which is the qualia. You not only have one qualia, you have five qualia, right? In some in one fell swoop, he's saying, well, it doesn't matter that there are five. I'm just going to say it doesn't matter, something like that, right? And I need my sound and my, you know, touch my computer screen and look at the screen and sounds and, you know, whatever. I'm not tasting it, right? But, you know, at least a, a good chunk of the uh, qualias I'm using in order to understand. You're telling me qualia doesn't really matter, right? That is fucking stupid, man, right? I think it will depend on which draft they get to see. And... It's like that with behavior, as Dennett sees it. Which draft of experience gets to influence your behavior, to influence what you say or how you respond in other ways, all depends on exactly when and where you're asked or, um, or when uh, some sort of response is required from you. It might not be a, a verbal response. You might be asked to press a button or give some other indication of what you experienced when you're probed, as Dennett puts it. And different probes will access different drafts of experience, uh, indicated by the, the, the arrows here. Um, tapping into different streams of, of processing. Now, the result of all the probing will be for something like a, an account of your experience to emerge, a, a, a narrative. We could put together the results of all the different probes and get a sort of story about what you experienced. But a different set of probes might have produced a different story, and that would have been equally, um, equally uh, legitimate. And its point is that there are no fixed facts about the stream of consciousness independent of particular probes. We get a story about the stream of consciousness by probing it. Otherwise, there's just lots of potential for different stories. So that's Dennett's uh, attack on the Cartesian theater and his um, uh, alternative model, his replacement model. We might sum it up by saying that the problem with the Cartesian theater is that it makes a confusion, involves a confusion between personal and subpersonal levels in the way that we talked about it. Uh, I, I'm not sure I understand what the hell this then guy is trying to, to, to say here, right? It seems like, yes, your experiences are constantly in a flux, so to say, right? You might experience an elephant and then you're no longer experiencing elephant or you might, in the, that was, which was red just now, might change to brown or, you know, whatever, right? even if it's a part of the same object or whatever. Yes, that's just how it is. I mean, uh, whatever, however it changes is however it changes. But that the qualia changes doesn't invalidate the qualia, does it? So I, I, I don't see, I, I don't feel that he's got to the point where he can say, well, fuck qualia. He's constantly talking about qualia. And he needs to give me some qualia in order to argue for this case against qualia. So it seems a very, very convoluted way of talking about colors and sounds and so on, and then objectifications of these you know, conceptualizations among these uh, qualia, right? Different probes will accept different drafts of experience. What is a probe? Which draft gets to influence verbal report or other behavior depends on exactly when and how the person is questioned or probed. But you can't get other people to tell you how you should understand things, right? Yes, you can say you could be inspired by it and so on, but that's not philosophy. Philosophy is something you do about your experience in order to understand it, right? Or, or settle on an understanding. Maybe you can't uh, reason your way to everything. You need to have these axioms where you say, okay, I'm going with this, right? And this reporting, who cares? They might be fucking lying, man, right? Have you heard of lying? Or conjuring, or maybe have something that they're unsure about and then they sort of pick and choose whatever they want. Maybe they have an agenda, right? Fuck these reports, man, right? I don't know. We talk about people having experiences, seeing things, tasting things, feeling pains, and so on. 
but you don't know if you can't get to people's experience. If them if they report an experience, that doesn't mean you know or have access to that experience. Right? A report is not the thing itself. It's not what it's being reported. A book about the Eiffel Tower is not the Eiffel Tower. A photograph of the moon is not the moon, right? A report of an experience is not experience. So no matter how many reports you gather, you can never get to whether or not there are other minds than your own. Right? The, that is the classic problem, which is called you know, the problem of the minds. So you are left with your own experience in order to get to everything you need within your philosophy. And they, these descriptions are constructions out of their reports and reactions, including their reports to themselves. And uh, We can probe ourselves, it's important to stress, by asking ourselves what we are seeing or experiencing at any particular moment. The mistake is to suppose that there must be some subpersonal uh, 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 correlate of this that experience must involve some mental version of experience that is uh, constructed and presented to other um, subpersonal systems. That's a bad picture of consciousness, then it thinks, and we need to get rid of it if we're to avoid heading into what are simply dead ends and asking ourselves questions that have no answers. Well, let's move on now to Dennett's 2005 book, Sweet Dream. We just have to get rid of it. It, it, doesn't sound, it doesn't sound good to me, right? Just saying, well, I can see only dead ends, so I just get rid of the question or get rid of some part of my experience in order to, so that I don't have to look at it, right? Ah... You have to make arguments, right? You can't just say, I'll get rid of it, right? It doesn't prove too good to me, right? This is a follow-up to Consciousness Explained. It uh, expands on the, uh, uh, the case there, adds new arguments, new uh, examples and response to More than it. And we'll look at a couple of examples from uh, Chapter 4 of that book uh, involving change blindness and Mr. Klapgrava. I'll begin with change blindness. Uh, this isn't a, a thought experiment, it's a, it's a real psychological phenomenon um, where an image changes uh, sometimes in quite dramatic ways as you're looking at it, with a little flicker in between each change usually. And uh, often uh, uh, one can look at these images for quite some time without noticing the change. And let, let me illustrate this with, with some examples. These are from uh, Kevin O'Re the, the website of Kevin O'Regan, uh, uh, the, the psychologist Kevin O'Regan, and I encourage you to, to, to explore his website and look at some of the fascinating um, materials there. Okay, so I'm going to show you an image now that will uh, change uh, in quite a, quite a, a significant way, uh, with a little flicker between each change, and see how long it takes you to notice uh, the change. What the fuck, man? So perhaps oh. some of you have, have noticed it already. Uh, it's quite a large change in color. Yeah. This is not. This is sort of screwing with your mind, right? It's okay, not well, sort of hallucination. If you it, I'll tell you that it's it's a change in the color of the. But the, nobody experiences. Yeah, you can experience because it's on a p computer screen. But your mind has evolved outside in the sort of real world, the uh, the analog world, so to say, for millions of years. They're not seeing this thing here, right? Unless there's some, something, you know, a, a, in nighttime, a lightning strike or anything, something like that. That, And then you wouldn't go around and say, I have to figure out if some point something is changing. You don't need to do that, right? What you need to do is a find shelter somewhere and make sure that you you know where you are compared to where the 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 food is, and you know, the next day you have to go hunting or whatever, right? That's what you need to understand. You don't need to check whether or not and and color changed over there. 
the mind is not geared toward this stuff. And then you can provoke the mind into, aha, so you didn't see this, you didn't see that. So there, there was a qualia, but you didn't get the qualia. No, the mind is not geared to giving you a perfect presentation of whatever is out there. Because, it, first of all, it can't get to it because it, it's a representation of what is out there, right? If there is an out there. And if you're saying there is an out there and it's a representation, it can merely be a representation. So it can never be that which it is, which is that which is based on, right? So, and it might also say, well, I don't need all of this stuff. I'm using more, too much energy. Whatever something, uh, I, I only need to focus my understanding of this experience to that which I actually need, right? And if the light is flickering, who gives a crap, right? But I need to identify the tiger. I don't give a crap about flickering lights, right? So the mind is sort of, it, it's just fluffy in that area, you could say, right? And that doesn't prove anything because there's still qualia. Yeah, the qualia might shift in weird, weird ways, but who gives a crap? It's the tiger I'm interested in, right? Should I fight it? Should I fuck it? Should I flee from it? Or should I eat it, right? Grass at the at the front of the picture in, in, in front of the fence changes from uh, green to uh, uh, a gray brown. Okay, I'll, I'll show you another. Uh, there's also a, a the, the movie thing, right? The, the movies in, in in olden days they showed 24 pictures a second, right? And these pictures are gelled together in the mind. And the mind doesn't see 24 pictures. It it gels it together to a, a full picture. And that's because that's how things work in order to get to what you need to function, right? The mind is not trying to get to the point of perfect representation or the most elaborate presentation of what is out there, right? It's trying to get to something that works, right? Just like uh, on your desktop, you don't have a, an icon for everything that you can possibly have an icon for, right? You only have those icons you need, and then you, you leave the rest of the icons outside. Because those are the icons you need. You need, you know, your email, and you need your, you know, web browser, and, you know. All the, all the billions of, of icons you can possibly make that might make some kind of sense, you don't make them because you don't need them, right? The same thing the mind does, right? And you can find sort of areas of the how the mind works that are sort of left to chance in a way, right? Because it, it's not important for the mind to deal with this stuff at the point of evolution that the mind is in at the moment, right? Your mind now. Let's see if you can see how long it takes you to spot this change. This one took me some time. I don't think I don't think this blinking works on my presentation. So if you want to see this, you need to go and find um, uh, Mr. Frankish's presentation here on Lecture 2, The Case Against Qualia on, on Moscow, okay, something. Well, Moscow Center for Consciousness. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, tell you that the change is in the, in the top uh, center of the picture. The level of the horizon changes quite dramatically between each... Um, each flicker. Okay. No, but but you did get that there are two boats, right? And there are a lot of people. You were not in doubt that there were two boats and or maybe three boats, but at least two boats, right? And there were people working as a bit of uh, high seas. You did get that within a fraction of a second, maybe, right? And yeah, yeah, the 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 horizon might change a bit. Who gives a crap? What is interesting is that there are two boats with people in it, right? That's what your mind is interested in. There. If yeah, if one of the boats suddenly disappeared and there was only see, you would immediately recognize it. But because it's something that is insignificant to the story the mind is trying to get to, it doesn't it doesn't care about it, right? So Frank is trying to find some little, you know, a nugget here and there and leaving the bigger picture out and focus on this little detail and then therefore no qualia, right? Ah. Okay, one more example of a slightly different kind. Um, again, from Kevin O'Regan's website, though, um, 
designed by um, a, uh, uh, a colleague of his, Renaud Chabrier. I need to start this one and uh, the change here is more gradual. See if I, there, okay. So. When do you notice a change? Probably noticed it by now. It's a, it's a continual change in uh, in colour, and uh, it's I'll find the cursor. It's quite a, a dramatic change, uh, even in the early stages. If I if I um, jump between the, the the start, a little bit later, later, you see how the colour is changing all the time. Um, but it takes some time. Yeah, but that's exactly my point. The quail are there to give you an idea of what we're dealing with. And then the mind extracts or creates concepts. The concepts are not the quail. The quail are there to create the concepts, potentially, right? But th that's not why they're there, but they're there. And then the mind creates the concept. Like, you know, horse, carousel, um circular plateau uh buildings whatever right person but if one of these disappeared your mind would see it immediately you would be aware of that immediately because that's the important thing that that the the plateau or, or the the plint what is called um the turntable <laughs> that changes from orange to violet is not important because it's still the same object it's still the same concept so it doesn't care about what color it has because that might be the change of the shadows or the, the, the clouds or the, the whatever, the moon, whatever, right? It's, it's not the color of it. It's the concept that is identified from the qualia that is important. And that's why these examples exactly only deal with changes of, of blemishes of color or maybe sort of a ge geometric that is not important for the bigger story of this, like the, the horizon changing uh, level in the previous picture, right? So, but if if the center of this carousel suddenly disappeared or the turntable there disappeared, then you will notice it immediately because that's the concept you have arrived at that disappears or is no longer active. So. For for you to notice the change. But I would say that I am intrigued by that the color, it, it just reinforces my own philosophy that the, as when you have objectified your quality experience of the qualia, the qualia is no longer important because now you have the concepts and that's what the mind is interested in, apparently, right? Because the changing the colors here doesn't change your experience of those, the story of it, you could say, the concept story, right? As When first you have objectified that qualia, the, the quality of the qualia, the quality of the qualia, so to say, the color shade of the qualia, it doesn't matter anymore, right? And it changes slowly so that the, you can sort of boil the frog. And if it changes like this, okay, you might say, well, that's a quick change, right? But this, the gradual change is sort of, it doesn't register very well, right? Okay. Now, so there are lots more examples of these, and you can uh, you can explore some more on uh, uh, Kevin O'Regan's website and... Uh, and find other examples on, on the web. Okay, so I think now. this is where we will stop this time. Uh, we are going, uh, heading in, there's one minute to, to the one hour mark of my presentation here. So uh, please share, like, and subscribe. And, you know, go check out the Discord uh, link in description or maybe in an early, if I don't get to, sometimes I forget to create a description um, after I've uploaded. So, and please join the Discord then. Uh, uh, otherwise, leave a comment here if there's something you find uh, weird in my presentation so I can elaborate on that. And otherwise, have a very nice day. See you later.